Hello and welcome to Good News with Angela Savage. I have a very, very special show today. Here I am, uh, I've got turn four behind me and the finish line ahead of me at the Indianapolis 500 Motor Speedway, one of my favorite places on earth. And I have a guest today that I'm so very proud of. He doesn't need much of an introduction. Mario Andretti has come to be on my show today. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on the show. My pleasure. This is such a special honor. Um, you know, being with you takes me back to the, the time and the sport that I, I wanted to be around in. And so this is just, this is great. This is very sentimental and I appreciate it. Um, I'm sure that a lot of people are beckoning for your attention during the month of May. So thanks again for making a little slice for, for a savage, for her show. We're here for savage, yes. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much. I wanted to tell you that as a child, um, you were the name that I dropped when I was with my schoolmates and I would try to get them to understand exactly who my father was. I'd say, you know, sweet savage, Mario Andretti, and yours, yours was the name I used uh, for them to try and make the connection. So you've always had uh, a spot in my heart and in my and in my life, you know, as as who I spoke about to to explain to other people who who exactly my father was. We share that the connection to STP it was like a, a family word in my house, Annie Granatelli. Um, but whatever the, the reason may be, thank you for, for being my connection back to the, the community and for the name that I used. Well, my pleasure indeed, <laughs> yes indeed. Uh, thank you yeah. for that. I mean, thank you know, you. Swede was really a, a, a great guy that I, uh, I had the pleasure and honor to race against, you know, for a few years. Um, and uh, so just to to be on a show here with you, I think it's something that, uh, as you can see, brings back that part of uh, the memories, the fun memories that I had with your dad, which, uh, you know, he was uh, one of the unfortunate ones of the period, you know, and uh, which uh, he would have been multi-champion, I can guarantee you, you know, with his ability, uh, he was right at the peak of his career, and, uh, and he obviously had great opportunities ahead of him yet to take advantage of but uh, but anyway just um, you know glad to see you he uh, obviously um, you know he he should be very proud of you at this point you know I'm sure he's smiling up there well that really means a lot to me you know it's taken a long time for me to get back to the community and um, I've had such a warm welcome home that it's hard to realize how much love there is for these gentlemen 40 years later unless you come back and experience it for yourself. You'd be surprised, yes I agree because I don't want to interrupt you but uh, uh, motor racing is really a very small family as a whole you know we uh, uh, there's a special love when things don't go so well for somebody else you almost feel like you know you're own family is affected, you know. So, as you can see, and uh, uh, champions like that will never, will never be forgotten. I can assure you. Thank you. Thanks for saying that. Now, before I left uh, to come here for the month of May, I was flipping through a couple of photo albums at the house, and I was happy to run across some pictures of you and my dad from the '70s. Take a look at those for a minute. Well, it looks like driver meetings. Yeah, I was going to ask you, um, do you happen to know like where that might have been or, <laughs> or what you were saying or how the race went? Any, any sort of details about the photos that you can well, remember? This, this actually could be uh, a Formula 5000 race somewhere because he raced Formula 5000 as well, not just IndyCar. Uh, there's one here. This one looks like, uh, looks like Indy. Uh, I don't even know if I still have the sunglasses. They're really cool. <laughs> Those are the coolest shades. And uh, this one looks like Riverside. Fantastic. California. So, yeah, you can see we, we covered a lot of ground together. Yeah, I would actually like for you to have these. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah, you. these are my gift to you. Um, not long before my dad arrived in India in 1972, you were the new star on the scene. You were the man to beat. Um, once you became an established winner, 
How did it feel when other new stars came on board, like Swede and Rick Mears, Al Unser Jr., Paul Tracy? What was it like when all the new hot shoes were trying to come up behind you and take some of your wins? Well, uh, you know, as a competitor, if you go, oh, no, another thorn on my side type of thing. You know? Right. It's a natural thing. And uh, I know that uh, when I was coming through the ranks, uh, I know how the stars of the moment or the, you know, the top guys were feeling about me. So it's a normal cycle, if you will. And, um, but uh, you're right, you know, Swede fit that category because you knew that sooner or later to get anything done, to get any result, you're gonna have to deal with them, you know? And, uh, and, and it was, uh, but it makes a difference uh, when you see a certain personality uh -huh. You know, the, and, and somebody that you know you can strike, and quite honestly, I'm not just saying because of you, a strike an almost immediate friendship. Um, and, and, you know, so uh, from that standpoint, yeah, you want to beat them, you want to do that, but you also like to be around them, and you like, you cherish the challenge, you know, right. that they, and, you know, the better they are, the more, obviously, that uh, they contribute in up in your own game yeah if you know what i mean if, uh, if anybody comes on the scene that's unknown so to speak and uh is so sort of at this level and you've been somewhere here if a man i gotta step it up type of thing that's the way it works you know so uh he was he was one of those individuals that uh created that situation for sure because he he was there to score you know he was there he was serious and he was and good. he had the ability you know mm -hmm. he had the ability he had everything going for him. He you sure know. did. Good looking dude too, you know. You know, just so <laughs> handsome. It should almost be illegal. Like they should yeah. maybe call it a distraction or something. It's just yeah. a little distraction. But then Mario, you'd fall under that category too, just for the record. But he was tall too. Yeah, that tall and the blonde hair and yeah, he was pretty good looking. I have to, if I do say so myself, <laughs> humbly. Uh, do you think the fact that you and Andy Granatelli shared an Italian-American heritage gave you a connection to him that maybe other drive, drivers didn't quite get? Well, it's possible, uh, you know, of course, you know, it's, uh, uh, I've been called Granatelli, actually, oh, oh. by people, uh, I, <clears throat> I remember that I bought my first airplane and uh, the pilot came with it and uh, so he lands and, you know, we first meet, he says, uh, Oh, it says, nice to meet you, Mr. Granatelli. I said, well, that's a good start. <laughs> you know, so, Try again. Crazy, yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, then you had signs here on the tower terraces, um, Andretti Granatelli, very interesting, you know, that type of thing. But it had that connection, of course. Uh, um, you know, Andy was uh, a magical individual in so many ways because uh, he was a promoter's promoter in a sense, you know. He, uh, I think um, uh, he uh, is a definitely, at least for the time, was a, a case study about marketing. Mm. And what he's done with SDP was just uh, absolutely phenomenal. And then, and then taking advantage of every moment, like, uh, you know, after winning the race here, uh, you know, here we go, and then he's expanding the brand to Europe. Yeah. And, uh, and then you see, you can be in Austria, you can be anywhere. You know, you see SDP signs, you go to a gas station, you see SDP signs, you know. Everywhere. And, and you know, he had that ability to just charge, charge, charge. And, uh, um, and again, that's why he was successful. It was fun to be around. And, um, and I know how much, you, you know, effort he made to win this race. You know, I mean, over the years, with uh, always thinking outside the box, you know, with the no vice, and then it comes with it you know, the turbine cars and, and all that. And, and then here I go win with a, you know, pretty much a standard car, which actually was a spare car, you know, because, spare uh, car. yeah, because actually um, I owned the team in 68 and uh, he bought the team from me in 69 and uh, already had a situation with Lotus. We, we arrived here with the four wheel drive Lotus, you know, state of the art. Uh, great aerodynamics and you know the, everything except there was no uh, reliability in, in that particular car. In fact, uh, two two days before 
qualifying, I crashed very heavily and destroyed the car, mm. and and uh, I had some you know some burns and so forth, and mm. then we had to pull out the um, the spare car, which we never intended to race. It was a spare car. Spare car. That was different. It was a standard you know Hawk Browner Hawk, which was a new car for that for that year, but um, and. Um, and that's what we put on the front row, you know, two days later, you, you know, did and, it. and we won with it. Don't yeah, you it. did it. I mean, the car was a good car because uh, the race before Indianapolis, which was Hanford, California, I had won mm -hmm. with that car, you know, so, you know, it was a worthy car. But as I said, it was nothing for the moment outside the box, if you will. And, uh, and here we bring home the victory f for him. And, and it was a special satisfaction for me knowing how much Indy meant to him because uh, you know, for me, it's it's bigger than Indy. It's the series. It's the series. You know, Indy, of course, is one race, but it's one race for me. Right. So, you know, as a driver, it was always the championship. I wanted, you know, so I could never have driven for Andy Grantel because all he worried about is Indianapolis. That's all it was for him. Well, for you me, had bigger goals yeah, than that. Yeah, bigger goals than that. You know, but uh, the fact that uh, I was able to bring it to him. First was uh, you know something I felt really good about because I, I knew you know it meant a great deal to me of course you know it's like lifting the 900 pound gorilla off your shoulders you know? because it's almost a uh, indie as an event uh, it's almost like a must win because you judged you know your career is judged on, on this particular one race you yeah know? yeah it's unfair. Very unfair. Unfair. But, but that's the way it is. But uh, again, going back to what it meant to him, I say finally he got it, you know? And I was the one that was able and to you bring did it, it to him, you know? So. Yeah, I've heard about the kiss that you received from Andy in Victory Lane after winning the 1969 Indy 500. Still smell the garlic. Yeah. Still smell the garlic. <laughs> that's hilarious. Now that was your first win and his first win as well. So you both here, I mean, you both, um, got to share that excitement all together. Right. Now, how did that win compare to you, to your 78 Formula One World Championship win? Well, people ask me that question, and it's uh, here again, talking about a race and a championship. Different. You cannot equate the two. I mean, a championship is the result of an entire season. Right. And Indianapolis is one race. Right. Now on a career level as far as the importance uh, I think Indianapolis uh, arguably is worth the championship to some people uh, but um, you know uh, the world championship is something that um, was part of my uh, most ambitious goals when I was still really truly dreaming you know still living in Italy and um, you know I saw my very first Formula One race in Monza, mm -hmm. Italian Grand Prix, when I was 14 years old, mm -hmm. and um, we came to America in 1955, which I was 15 then, and uh, and again uh, I started pursuing a dream a couple of years later by racing, but it was always Formula One was always in the back of my mind, and uh, and when I I mean I could have not have scripted that in my life in any possible way by clinching the world championship right there in Monza and then winning the Italian Grand Prix you know it's um, you know again how do you formulate that but uh, ultimately when they talk about satisfaction career-wise that is the ultimate for me mm -hmm. not many people around you know would appreciate that but I do I mean when when you uh, when I am asked to compare that with anything else in my career you know that is it. That is it. Well, yeah, in 1981, um, as a 42-year-old uh, Italian-American who had been out of Formula One for about a year, um, and then you did the one-off drive for Ferrari. 82, at, yeah, 1982. 82, yes, at Monza. So I had heard that that was the first track that you went to with Aldo and your uncle when you were younger where you got the bug. Yeah, you, you're right, obviously. I just said that... Uh, that's where I saw my very first race, but uh, I, I had already won there, already won there in sports cars with Alfa Romeo, you know, so, but uh, in 1982, um, Ferrari did not have a very good year with drivers, you know, the car was very good, but they, they lost uh, Gilles Villeneuve and then Didier Pironi, they lost two drivers, you know, that season, and uh, for 
the last race, the last two races actually, I was asked if I would be willing to drive and substitute, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, so obviously, as you said, I was out of Formula One by about nine months, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, but I accepted, of course, and uh, went to Monza and put the car on pole and, uh, and led the race until I think about, I was about three laps from the end, uh, uh, something happened to the turbo on the left bank and uh, I had stick in throttle, and, but I still finished third, I still finished podium. So what is significant to me is the fact that uh, I won my very first Formula One race in South Africa in 1971 and, and I ran the very last race, Formula One race in my career with Ferrari. Now, in between, I had opportunities uh, to race full-time for Ferrari, but uh, whenever I was free, uh, their seats were full. And whenever, and so we never really could combine it. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, the fact that uh, I was able to race with Lotus and, and, and win the world championship, obviously, you know, was not so bad. Not so <laughs> after bad. All. But, uh, um, but it's, you know, what's amazing is that even the connection with, uh, with Lotus, the connection with Lotus started in 1965 when I was a rookie here because uh, Colin Chapman and Jim Clark obviously were competitors here. In fact, J uh, Jim Clark won that race. I finished third in my rookie year. And uh, after the banquet, uh, after the race, um, I went to uh, Colin Chapman. I said, Colin, I said, someday I would like to race in Formula One. And he says, uh, Mario, he says, when you think you're ready, you call me. So three years later, 68, I called him. And of course, you know, he says, yeah, we said we will test in Monza. And uh, Monza, I tested for two days and I broke the track record, which was set a week before by Chris Amon with a Ferrari. Nice. And then, but uh, there was a, you know, uh, a big problem with a 24 hour rule. I had to come back here on a Saturday and race. And then, uh, <clears throat> and then they won't let me start the race in Monza. Mm. They said that because uh, it was one hour deficiency there or something. But the following week was my actual real de debut at Watkins Glen with Lotus. And I was on pole in my very first race mm -hmm. you know, in Formula One. So you can see, you know, F1 was really hoo hoo. You know, for me it was, uh, it was huge and, and, and everything was falling into place nicely. Why? Because I was with a top team. You know, I had, just like when I was Ferrari, I was always with a top team. And, uh, and good fortune there, of course, because, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to score. So uh, yeah. that's the story as to how, you know, the, the Formula One thing started. And, you know, of course, uh, I was in 128 Formula One races in my career. Wow. You know, so, and, and I'm very proud that, you know, the fact that uh, I carried the U.S. colors Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing about Formula One is that um, you almost feel like you're, you're in the Olympics, you know, because you're, it, it obviously it's purely Whoa. international mm -hmm. and, and you're carrying, you know, your, your country's colors. colors. And, uh, and you know that in 1977, I won uh, the uh, U.S. Grand Prix at, what, at um, Long Beach, mm -hmm. U.S. Grand Prix, and I also won the Italian Grand Prix in Italy. So. I won my native Grand Prix, and I won Came here. Yeah, my Grand Prix of my new home, America. So uh, that's something very special for any driver to win the home Grand Prix, you know, your country's Grand mm -hmm. Prix. And, and that happened to me, you know, so uh, sometimes I pinch myself as to how fortunate I've been. Well, it's funny you say it's because I had the best teams and the best cars, but you're, you know, your driving is what got you there, too. Well, yeah, you're yeah, the best, too. Uh, Angela, you need the package. I mean, you need, the whole obviously, package. if you have a good car, you need to take advantage of it and, and, and squeeze everything out of it, you know. Uh, you can't do one without the other, obviously, and uh, you have to do your job. Uh, so, but um, it starts with the equipment, and if you don't have the equipment and the team, you know, because a lot of people don't realize how much motor racing is team, 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 team sport. You know, it's, um, I, I look at um, the driver is like the quarterback. 
Right. You know, you can have the best arm, the best everything, but unless you have a good, you know, unit, good offensive unit, you know, to take care, to protect you, to be able, you have good receivers and, and so on and so forth, uh, you know, you cannot show your talent. So uh, in motor racing, they better have the car, you know, that's capable. Then it's up to you to get it done. That's right. That's right. And also, um, with our with Sebastian Bourdais' incident the other day, thank God he's okay. Um, the safety crew was there so fast, and and it really made me realize how far the safety has come. And you know, I. It makes me feel a little bit better to know that people like my father didn't die in vain, that he's still saving people's lives today a little bit because, you know, of all the changes that they've made and just seeing how how organized and how quick they were there and everyone had a certain thing to do and it was it was very clean and um, and of course the drivers I'm sure appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but it's even more than that. It's not just a safety crew. I mean look what has been done to the tracks, the walls, and, yeah, the safety barriers, safe, safe walls, and the cars themselves. I mean, you look at the cars that uh, uh, we were driving in the 70s when when your dad was killed, and and the cars of today, the protection that you have, and this was a work in progress that started right around the time you know when uh, when your dad you know had his accident. But there were we were losing weight. Too many. Too we used many. to lose four or five guys a year. That's a lot. You know? And that's like going to war. You know, at the beginning of the season, you know, you look around and say, I wonder who's going to be here at the end. It was that kind of a thing. And, um, and so us drivers as a movement, we started thinking, you know what, uh, and talking uh, not just to the engineer, but to the sanctioning bodies, you know, so we've got to do something here. I mean, we want to race tomorrow. Now, we are so smart mm -hmm. that, um, you know, we're making the cars go faster and faster. We have more technology. Why can't we use some of that knowledge to make them safer? Now, uh, the reason safety features have to be mandated in a race car is because almost every feature is a performance penalty, either weight, aerodynamic, and so forth. So, uh, if you're going to add something, make something, create something in a race car like a different bulkheads, you know, to uh, be able to uh, absorb, absorb the G's. you know, the G's and so forth, and protection, this and that, uh, has to be mandated, every car has to have it, you know, so, and, and it took a long time, you know, to get the uh, sanctioning bodies to really embrace that in movement, and, and, uh, and once it started now, it's been a work in progress where uh, safety is paramount. You know, it's been dealt with seriously in every possible way. Like you said, when, uh, you know, it, it was fire that, that really killed your dad. Mm -hmm. Because he, he, he was fine. I mean, he, was, he would have survived he otherwise. He would have survived the fire. You know, so here's the fire situation. And then, uh, you know, who contributed to the fire situation? Vietnam technology. You mm -hmm. know, there's, yeah, you know, what they used to do with the fuel tanks on, on, the, uh, on the helicopters, mm. you know, it could take a, you know, 20 millimeter uh, gun yeah, shell, you know, and well, no, it wouldn't blow up, you know, so we started using, you know, those, that type of um, uh, well, technology in the fuel tanks and so forth. So, like I said, it was, you know, took a while, but um, the sport has come a long way and very responsibly. And, um, and again, like you saw the accident, would not have been survived Amen. by you know, just what we saw, you know, with Bourdais, the speed that he, that he, he hit really the hit the wall. I mean, there's no way he would have survived it without a safe barrier and the protection that he had around him. So, right. I mean, he'll be racing in a couple of months, you know, right. so. And the walls you know, too, I mean, it was Well, just that's what I'm saying. The the cement, walls and, well, the, the wall, you know, the safe barrier really can absorb a tremendous amount of Gs you know, where it will not be transferred to the car directly. And, um, and so, again, uh, yeah, uh, good things have happened along the way. And, and as you can see, you know, some of our guys pay the price to show, hey, that something needs to be done. You know, yes. and uh, no question about that. Yes. 
Uh, now you've driven approximately 166 different race cars, types of race cars. Would you say that's about right? I'm wondering, was there ever a car that you just couldn't wait to get out of? Not your favorite car, but was there a car that really scared you that you just kind of wanted the day to be over? Well, yeah, there is a car like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was called a honker. A honker? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was, doesn't even sound right. Even the even had, even had a weird name, and uh, they still have it, and they still run it in the vintage car races. Really? It was a Can Am car. Yeah, a Can Am car that uh, uh, was a Ford effort at the time, and um, obviously it was built by uh, a great designer, Len Terry. You know, who had a bad dream, I think, and then he designed this car. <laughs> He had a bad dream, yeah. and then we got the honker. <laughs> and we got the honker, and um, yeah, that's one car that uh, I didn't mind just getting out of and said, let somebody else yeah, drive it. That's enough of that. Uh, now, when you step into a new race car for the first time, how long does it take you to figure out this is a really good car? Well, let me tell you something about it. New cars, uh, you know, uh, every year we always add a new car. You know, we're waiting for a new car. And, and you're like an expectant father, you know, you wait and you can't wait for the car. Stork is coming. Go, yeah, stork is coming. <laughs> but sometimes that new child either has cross eyes or a short leg, shorter <laughs> leg, and it's not always the perfect child. You, know, so, so, you love it anyway? So the, they, yeah, you love it anyway because it's all you got and you're stuck with it. You know, and, and you try to make the best, you try to dress it up and put some lipstick on it and everything else. <laughs> but uh, some race cars uh, sometimes are a little bit hopeless mm -hmm. and others come off, you know, as I say, come off the trailer, you know, already right in a ballpark, you know. So it's always a big surprise. But the anxiety, the weight is always, you know, something that you look forward to because, again, it's something yeah. new. And that's something that uh, kept me motivated, quite honestly. You know, uh, you know, today they have, you know, it's great today because it, you know, tightens up the competition a little bit because uh, it's pretty much of a spec series, you know, uh, pretty much everybody has about the same thing. Uh, it could be a little bit boring, you know, for a driver sometime. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm glad that, um, you know, in the time until the late 90s when I was still active that it was still a new car every year, you know, I like that yeah. part. Yeah, that that's why, you know, that's one of the things that it, to me is attractive in Formula One, you know, we could always have, always have a new, a car, new car, car or something. That's one of the fun things about the, the vintage programs going on. I love to go to the Brickyard SVRA here because that really has the juice of my dad's era and the history and all the cars. And all the different, different, different cars, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you, do you like to do any of these vintage races? Do you go to these things? I, I love watching and so forth, but the biggest problem with me is uh, uh, I'm kind of, uh, I'm not the smartest guy on the planet. And uh, when I get in a vintage car, which I've done, you know, older cars, I just, I, I cannot just go out there and parade around. I really you push it. You want to on it. I push it and I've done that in England. So then I'm thinking, you know what? I survived that era. Why do I want to kill myself now? You know? yeah. I'm thinking because yeah. I cannot go out there and say, "Oh, you can't, you can't, you know, uh, overtake or anything until the third turn or whatever." Now, so it's not my style. So I uh, just let other people. No parade laughing for you. No, no. It's Mario Andretti. He's got well, a stomp on it. You know, it's no fun. You know, it's no fun to just do it. Right. And, uh, if either do it or you don't. So unless I can do it the way I want. You, you know, don't. then I don't. <laughs> That's fun. Um, now, your first IndyCar win was on a road course just a few miles to the west um, here at Indianapolis Raceway Park. Tell us about that. Well, it's interesting that uh, this was my rookie year, it was just in 1965, and that's when I was still thinking Formula One. And if you remember, I said that um, Colin Chapman says, you know, as soon as you feel you're ready, so I needed some road racing experience. So I lobbied like crazy, you know, to USAC to start to get into some, to some road racing. I said, because we go into all these ovals. Yeah. Sometimes we repeat, we go twice a year to the same ovals and so forth. Let's get some road racing in there. And that's when it started. And I happened to win that first race. In fact, so I won. So you lobbied for the race. I won three won in a row. <laughs> and, 
And almost for about, if you look at the record, but for about the next three, four years when we started going to Mossport, or San Jovit, Riverside, and on and on, between um, uh, Dan Gurney and myself, we were winning all the races, either one, first or second, first or second, you know, so I loved, you know, that road racing activity that, that we had at the time because uh, it really helped me and that's what I needed. I wanted to do if I'm going to do Formula One, I got to do some road racing. You know, so it was a perfect thing that USAC was embracing and it really helped grow the series. It helped, I think, it, uh, it put more dimension, you know, to the series. And uh, because if you look at uh, even this, the IndyCar series, uh, it's at this level, it's definitely the most diversified, you know, series anywhere. You know, NASCAR, they got a couple of road races, but they're short circuit, you know, very simple. And uh, Formula One is strictly road racing. This series has got everything. It's got super speedways, short ovals, street races, regular natural course, you know, road, road races. Uh, and the champion in this series is the most complete champion. You look at it, it's the most That's complete champion everything. of all of them because you have to be good. You cannot be good just at one part. You're not going to do it. I you know it's got to be, I mean, look at, you know, Scott Dixon, for instance, you know, uh, he's at the top of the sheets here at Indy. And next week in Detroit, I guarantee you he'll be at the top of the sheets. Yeah. You know, he's been a champion that a lot of people don't really actually appreciate. Right. You know, so uh, from the standpoint of the value and the series, probably they should uh, put a little more energy in, you know, being proud, proud, you know, being so yeah. proud of our champions, you know. They, yeah. It, because uh, again, they're the most complete uh, as far as abilities, and uh, that's what's wonderful to me about the IndyCar series, quite honestly. And that's uh, uh, on a level of appreciation and satisfaction for me, you know, winning, you know, okay, the world champion, this and that. But uh, in IndyCars, you know, for the championship, you know, when you look back in like in, say, 69. Uh, 69 for the world for the national championship I won races on the dirt I won Pikes Peak and I won Super Speedway and regular you know road course races so you know when you look at the spectrum the points going for that championship I mean I said I, you know that's awesome you know that's it really uh, is. I said, uh, it's a full spectrum and, winning yeah and, you know and, and the series gave me that opportunity you know to do all that you know, so uh, it should, for the sake of the series, the value of the series, all of that should not be should not go unnoticed. Right. The series should be very proud of that. They should. And now I'm I'm sure many people ask you this, but I'd like to know what is your favorite type of track? Do you prefer an oval or a road course or Pikes Peak or dirt? Is there something that you, I mean, just, just for fun, maybe not for competition, but what do you enjoy the most? Well, I, I love the challenges all around. Um, I love the dirt. I really love the dirt because of uh, the way, I mean, the go to hell type of <laughs> style that you have to use and, and, the, and, and uh, car control. And, and I felt, I always felt that actually, believe it or not, uh, developing skills on the dirt helped me in the wet races like in either IndyCar or Formula One on the road courses because there you're always looking for a different you know uh, track condition every almost every lap so you're searching you're adapting and you do that on the dirt and you got to do that in a wet situation so uh, it's it's as far apart as it seems it's really related really related you know so and then you know uh, oval versus road course. Well, I like both, and I hope no one asked me to just choose one. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just like my wines. You know, I like, <laughs> you know, so the wine. I says, don't let me choose just one. I like a couple different ones. You know what I mean? So. Well, if you uh, had to choose a red or a white, uh, is that the same thing? Like, don't make me choose. I like both. You like so, both. <laughs> you know, depends so, on what you're eating, right? Depend, yeah, depending on the day and the mood. So the same thing with uh, here's a, here's the other thing. Uh, Angela, I, I never, in my own mind, I uh, avoided rating the tracks like, oh, okay, I like this one, I can't wait to go there, but this one, ah, right. I think I, 
purposely. You know, I just uh, stayed neutral in the sense that I'm looking forward to all of them because your mindset is so important. You know, to be positive. Mm -hmm. No matter where you go, it says, even though realistically, sometimes you don't want to be realistic. Yeah. You right. know, realistically, maybe, you know, but if you go there with that mind, oh, yeah, okay, let's get this one over with it. You're done. You might as well stay home. Right. But if you have the mindset has to be positive, uh, no matter what, because you never know. That means you're on point all the way and going for the strike. And, and take every opportunity. And sometimes it may not have looked likely that you would be competitive, you know, that day on that particular course, and all of a sudden you win it. You win it. You know what I mean? So and it's happened, you know. So uh, people ask me, you know, what's your, you know, what was your favorite? I, they're all good, you know, they're all favorite. Good. They're all what I look I love all to. of them. I learned from all of them. You right. learn from all of them. And you know, yeah. there's always, you know, just uh, like your kids, you know, supposed to pick the favorite. Well, the kids, you know, any given day you love one more than the other, but <laughs> overall, <laughs> they're like my wines. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Depends people, on the day. You know, what's your favorite wine? They're like my kids. <laughs> any given day I love one more than the other. Depends so, on my mood. <laughs> but <I was> like, <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. Um, would you compare your brotherhood with your twin brother Aldo? Uh, with How would you compare? your brotherhood with your twin Aldo and the brotherhood of your own sons Michael and Jeff well you have to be there <laughs> you, you just have to, you be, have to there. be there I mean, <laughs> uh, with my twin brother I knew nothing else but twin I only had a, one brother and a sister you know older sister uh, but his twin brother seemed like um, there's so many similarities you know you're together right from the beginning when you're beginning to uh, you know, notice, oh yeah, there's another one like me walking around, you know, so, uh, and, and then uh, with Aldo, we had the same dreams, it seemed yeah. like, you know, to, uh, to pursue, and uh, as kids, we used to play and, and, and to try to imitate, you know, the people that were impressionable to us, and, and so uh, we were kind of, you know, just edging one and the other, and, and uh, so, uh, I don't know what other life would have been, you know. Uh, right. And it's it's hard to compare with um, two siblings that are maybe a year and a half apart, even. Right. You know, it's always oh, I'm the older guy and you know, the younger, the, the young kid, you know. <laughs> so it's uh, but um, uh, Mike and Jeff, you know, they um, they both I think were as far as pursuit, uh, you know, at school was both you know wanted to get into racing because why because that's all they knew because of, because they're because Andretti's. Of me, obviously you know but uh, but they had other choices you know that's uh, uh, I think I made that very clear you know I, I said to them both you know when it was a time when they were still in go-karts you know I said you know you don't have to do this I mean and in fact don't do it because you think that that's what I like to see you do I said uh, whatever you want to do I will support you Obviously, I said, but you have to have a true passion for whatever pursuit. I mean, you don't have to, but you should. And that's when, you, you get, that's when you're going to be successful in whatever succeed. your endeavor is. That's right. You know, as a mother of two young boys myself, Chance is 11 and looks exactly like his grandpa, Savage, and Cruz is five. He's the racer spirit, born running and still hasn't stopped. Um, I'd like to ask you, was there ever any resistance from your wife or even yourself when, when it came time to talk about your boys and going into racing, being all the you know, all the carnage that you've seen in the business, was there ever any resistance from, from, from Deanne or you um, being nervous to put him in the sport? Well, being nervous to put him in the sport, yes. No question about it. And that's why I tried to make it very clear. You know, I said that it's, it's not going to be a bed of roses. I mean, uh, if you're going to be successful at this, it's a lot of hard work, a lot of commitment, and, and a degree of sacrifice that to you, it should not seem sacrifice. It'd be sacrifice for people around you because you're only doing one thing. You're working every Sunday and all that sort of thing. Now, my wife, uh, she's stoic, a wonderful lady, solid, a rock. And she's one that um, uh, she'll never know how much she helped me in my career by being supportive in a very quiet way. 
Mm. You know, there's no hoopla, you know, like when I won, there's no ticker tape parade. And, and then, you know, if you didn't win, you know, you just, oh, uh, you know. Uh, so it was always even. Now she, in a sense, suffered in silence uh, by uh, not showing uh, the anxiety what she was going through because we have seen we lost some of my closest friends and she is she was friends with their wives and so forth so, so she knows she knew what could be out could there, happen you know what could happen but she never showed that to me because then I would feel guilty right it you would know, set so off she, a whole she kept me very serene and and uh, and the same thing like when the kids went on she would have been definitely happier you know, if they would have pursued something else, you right. know, but, um, you know, be a plumber or something. Be a plumber. <laughs> you know, but, uh, uh, but they decided to do this and, and in their own way, uh, her philosophy is, you know, I'm not going to stand in the way of their goals. What an amazing you woman. Know? And, uh, and, and again, the main thing was that they want to do it for themselves. That's something as clear as a bell. And I tried to, and I think Michael did the same thing, like with Marco and, and so forth. It's the uh, same thing when they're coming to the rank. Make sure you, you want to do it. You do it for yourself. And then from there on, you just pray. I mean, it's for me, uh, even when I was racing with my own kid, I raced on the same track with uh, Michael and Marco. In fact, in 91, there were four of us here. There was my, my nephew, John, was also, there were four of us which uh, is the first time ever and, or since, mm -hmm. you know, the four members of the family Unbelievable. made the 500. That's you know, fantastic. So, so uh, yeah, we had fabulous moments together and, uh, you know, but... I, I understand. People are starting to ask me, because Cruz is five, Chance is 11, but why aren't these boys in cars yet? You know, you should have them in cars. Are they going to follow their grandpa's footsteps? and? You know, there is a little resistance. It's sometimes it feels like, well, I, I kind of gave the ultimate sacrifice already, but just like you said, I would never stop them from pursuing any dream that they have. And now that um, I, I wasn't, I didn't talk about my, my father much before I came back in 2014 and sort of, you know, rebooted my, my love for this place. And I, I like to say it was like someone finally, um, like if I was a lamp, someone finally plugged me into the wall. But, um, you know, it's scary. It's scary thinking about your kids wanting to do that, but I, I just would never stop them. Cruz is such a racer spirit. And, you know, he, you're the name he uses now, too, in the house because it's always race this. Is that race. When he's real you're bad or something? Mario like Andretti! Mario! And he gets so excited. And before he, like, sprints around the house in laps, he just <laughs> runs. Mario Andretti, and so I, I, I want you to know that. Um, You're not just saying that. Are no, you? I am not just saying that, and uh, they wouldn't have even um, known much about their grandpa, and, and except that I got here and made peace with everything. So now it's always Papa Cars, which is sweet, or Mario Andretti, and then he runs faster than lightning. He's so fun. So now, as both a father and a race car driver. Was it hard to deal with the fact that the racing uh, career outcomes of Michael and Jeff were so different? Well, you can never predict that. You know, as far as uh, the outcome of anything, uh, I could have could I have ever predicted anything, anything that was happening to me? You know, it's uh, uh, you know it's one of those things. Opportunities come or go. Sometimes they're more available to certain people because you at the right time, right place, right time, all of that sort of thing. So uh, again, here, when I look at uh, Michael or Jeff, for instance, uh, Michael, I think it was like a laser, you know, it was just, uh, uh, everything was happening for him the right way. Jeff was driving with a black cloud over his head mm. all the time, for mm. some reason. Even coming through the rank, he was winning, you know, even, uh, you know, supervising and all that. Uh, but um, uh, every area when he was coming through, he had some incidents where, you know, it was not his fault. Somebody, you know, uh, was, if there was something going on, boom, he was in the middle of it. All mm. of a sudden, he get caught up. And, uh, and it happened, you know, like uh, the worst one here in, you know, uh, 1992 when 
Hub shared uh, on the card he was riding for AJ Foyt. And, uh, you know, the impact that he had, there were no safety barrier at that time uh, where he lost almost both his legs, you know, that. So that determined his career. Why? Why is Michael so lucky? Why am I so lucky? And why is Jeff so unlucky? Why is my twin brother so unlucky? My twin brother had an accident that basically determined his career at the end of the f very first season. I understood he was and, a really and, good driver, too. Yes, yeah. And, uh, and then he had an accident at the end of his career 10 years later. In fact, the week after Indianapolis for, in 69, you know. And um, so, again, it's not a given that we were lucky. That's why... You know, sometimes I even right. feel guilty, you know, right. but, I, but I do count my blessings every day because um, I don't take anything for granted, believe me. I, I know that I'm fortunate how many bullets I dodged, you know, Amen. for whatever reason, you know. I guess the, there's a plan there for everybody. And, uh, you know, so uh, when things are positive, you, know, you take it that way, but, uh, but, uh, but be thankful, that's all I can say. Amen. In 1992, um, in the Indy 500, when you crashed right here in turn four and you broke some toes, uh, and then Jeff came into the same hospital with, with severe lower uh, extremity injuries. Um, at that time, I mean, was that just, was that, that must have been so hard, being already in the hospital and then you know, here comes your children. You know, that, I, yeah, I, I mean, uh, was that a time when you were starting to think, gosh, you know, maybe this is, this is too much. Well, uh, it was, uh, those were trying moments, no question. I mean, 92, like you said, okay, uh, I made a mistake and I paid for it. You know, I had some broken bones and so forth. But, uh, and, and it, was one of, it was one of those years where they had, I mean, I think there were a couple of guys in front of me. One was uh, Emerson Fittipaldi and so forth that they were taken care of. So I was in line, they put me on ice and everything, so I'm waiting. All of a sudden, we get a code three, and I hear the name Andretti. Jeff Andretti. You oh know, my, my wife was there with me, and code three, I mean, is life threatening, you know. So, oh my. Uh, and also, wow. So, this is coming. So, uh, because of inju injury, they put everybody aside, and he took the priority, and they worked on him eight hours, you know, to, you know, put his legs together. And he had, you know, three other operations, majors after that. He was in the hospital for like three months. And, um, but going to that day, here I am and sedated, obviously. Um, and there was uh, one doctor just came over and he used to come over and says, yeah, he's just, you know, prop me up a little bit. He says, Michael's leading, Michael's leading, you know. And Michael was, I mean, he was leading big time. And um, he was by, by a lap and a half with nine laps to go. And, and the engine, you know, <sighs> let go. And, and so, meanwhile, I dozed off. And then I wake up and I see 4.30. Oh, the race is over. Nobody's congratulating me. Something and happened. Something happened to Michael. So I said, oh, gosh. Oh, you know, you're hoping he's not coming in. we survive this, yeah. we'll, we'll be, <laughs> Don't wheel we'll him be in great next. forever. <laughs> oh, Jimmy you Christmas. Know, but, uh, you know, it's just one of those moments. But then, you know, uh, I have an, another moment. Like in 1986, for instance, Pocono 500. Here we are. Um, Jeff is driving uh, the supporting race, the uh, like Indy Lights was ARS at the time. Michael is, of course, uh, driving the Indy cars. And Michael was on pole for the race. I won the 500. Jeff was on pole for his race, and he won his supporting race. Between the three of us, we cleaned house with everything there was, you know, that Unbelievable. Weekend. So, I mean, you know what I mean? So you got these ups and downs and moments. There was in 93, uh, I think, uh, 93, I think at, um, yeah, in Milwaukee, the podium was all, all Andretti. It was Michael, my nephew John, and myself, you know. So, uh, you know, as a family, we obviously had our great moments, you know. Yes. But this, everything goes with it, you know. There's, uh, and we somehow you're able to deal with the, the adversity, obviously. 
and, and don't be surprised when it's thrown at you. But um, overall, you know, we know how good the sport has been to us. Amen. You know, no question for me personally, I could not, not thought of uh, having any other life, quite honestly. Now, as a man of faith, was there ever, was there a specific moment when you realized that um, you've got some anointing on you and the protection of God over your family, um, not only for protection, but also the gift of success? Was there a specific moment when that came to you that you know that God's on your side or have you just always um, been a close man of God? Always, always. We have... Uh uh, we had clergy in our family. Uh, my uh, dad was r raised by a priest, and he was uh, the most wonderful man ever for us as even kids. He's one that was uh, so supportive. So, and, and when we came to America in 1955, uh, obviously, uh, not, you know, we left our grandparents and so forth, and my uncle, my uncle Priest is the one that I missed the most. And uh, so uh, that was always with us. Uh, and you know, we uh, I always relied on that. Uh, I know that uh, I didn't do it myself, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I know that. And that's what really kept me, gave me strength. You know, at times of trial, uh, I mean, there were moments where uh, in my life, uh, you know, uh, I think it was uh, when was in '82 or something. You know, when. Uh, uh, Gordon Smiley was killed qualifying, and uh, I had to be the next one out there. And and then uh, in six, I think it was 67, 68, my best friend Billy Foster. You know, we were like brothers uh, at Riverside. He was killed uh, just before I went out to qualify there in the stock car and friend. so forth. And oh. you know, so those are moments that you cannot endure. You cannot get through by yourself. And that faith carried me throughout. And it was just not just one moment. It was always through the good and the bad. But I always have felt I'm in your hands. You know, whatever plan you have for me, you know, I'll accept. And we go. Oh, that's just beautiful. That's, that's very beautiful. Yeah. Now, on a lighter note, um, we're running short on time now. I want to talk. I'm a huge animal lover. Yeah. And I understand that you had a pet pig named Martini for 17 years. And 10 months. And 10 months. Oh my goodness. So that just shows right there um, how much you cared for this pig. Um, how did you end up with the pig? I mean, this wasn't a, a fun little pet pop belly. This was the big pink nose no, pig. No, 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 no. Oh, tell no, me. No, wait a minute. Oh, oh, no, no, oh you no, have no. a Martini, picture. Mar oh, Mar yeah, he has a picture. Martini Let's see Martini. Not like that. I just Martini love it. Martini would not like that. Oh, he was cute. Definitely pink and piggy, but but I love pigs. I want one myself. It, oh, isn't he something? Isn't that's, your, that's your screensaver. My is, is Martini my, the pig. My pot belly pig. And, uh, and, you know, it's a misnomer about, you know, the little bitty because they only stay little bitty if you starve them. So Aww. I kept them nice. You know, <laughs> he, was, he was not really, you know, huge, but um, uh, he had a good life. I gave him the best life possible because he was my best buddy. You know, he and I used to talk to each other, you know, and uh, it's just amazing. They're, They're so smart. They're an amazing animal. I love, you know, we had dogs and you know, cats and all that, and they're wonderful. I mean, I had horses and, uh. and all that, but uh, uh, there's something about these pigs that uh, once you really get to know each other, you know, and they, and they trust you, it's like, you know, you can almost talk to them. And they, I believe and they, that. You know, he was uh, uh, talking <laughs> back to me, kind of, but always agreeing with me. You know, oh, that is so you know, cute. So neat. And the things that they do, and, uh, you know, they just, how the heck, you know, how does he understand that, you know? The, I, the pig whisperer, so the martini whisperer. <laughs> yeah, the martini whisperer. And, uh, uh, but again, uh, it's, and uh, I'll tell you what, for, uh, to be in a the house, they're the cleanest. Really? The cleanest pets, yeah, because they're very, and I, if you, they go outside, and if there's, gonna, a, if there's a mud puddle. They're going in the mud. You know, but <laughs> inside, and, uh, and the lowest maintenance pet we ever had, really? because, uh, yeah, you feed them twice a day, 
but they only need to go out once to relieve themselves, like in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then they're know? good? Yeah, I used to sit there and, uh, and do his thing, and I used to time him even, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and How then, fast can you go today, yeah, then, yeah, then get it done, <laughs> over, back in the house, he's good for another 24 hours. Oh my gosh, so you know? he wasn't indoor? Oh yeah, Pet. indoor, was, I have, oh yeah. He was one of the kids. I still have the cage there, it says in the Requiem. You know, martini. Oh, that, I have his blanket. I there. love that. I just love that. <laughs> and then, so you also had a parrot named Gonzo. Is he still with oh, us? Oh, yeah. Gonzo's, Gonzo's still around? 36 years old. 36 years old. Gonzo is a beautiful parrot. And he looks like 12. He's a beautiful looking <laughs> bird. He yeah, didn't get any, no, no gray feathers or anything. You know, he's just he's beautiful. He's aging he's well. A, yeah, he's a yellow Amazon. You men, you just get more attractive as you grow older. It's <laughs> yeah, not right. quite the same for the women. <laughs> I don't know how that worked out, Lord. But, but um, thanks for. Do you have any other pets that you just want to? Yeah, we tell have. Me? Uh, yeah, uh, we share the pug. Uh, I love pugs. With uh, yeah, with my daughter. You know, and he. Oh, he's a character, just a fabulous little dog. I mean, uh, the thing about animals, the beauty about animals, you can have the worst day in the world and they make you smile. It's true. I mean, uh, yeah. And uh, I look at this pug and, uh, and everything that he does, the way he walks, the way it makes me smile. Giggle. You know, it's just you want to you know, yeah. hug him and everything. And those faces, so those pug faces. I, I, I love animals, yeah, yeah. I do too. Well, I'd love to meet Gonzo one day, and maybe yeah, the pug, Gonzo, if that's yeah, possible. Yeah, he'll, uh, yeah, as soon as you arrive there, you'll say, Hello. You'll say hi. But the, I've you heard know, him you know, in some you know interviews talking in the background. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, oh, yeah, <laughs> you, pick up, you can pick up the phone. He even knows the iPhones, you know. As soon as you pick up, he sees the phone, he goes, hello, you know. But um, <laughs> you know what's interesting about, you know, even, even Gonzo? Uh, uh, when I'm gone for a long time, you know, and I come back, and the first thing he goes, Hi. Oh. You know, but you know, if I'm around in the morning, and I when I'm around, he goes hi. Hi. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> you know, so. Hi. Hi. I've missed yeah. you. Yeah. That oh, something? that is so sweet. I have a, I have my dog Rusty, who's you yeah. know we're joined at the hip. I've been away for about a month now, but um, we've actually learned how to video chat each other yeah. on the phone. I can put him on the camera, and he knows it's my voice, and yeah. it, it's just so sweet. Like you said, animals can really enrich in our lives in oh, ways that yeah, that um, nothing else can nothing yeah. else can yeah. unconditional love that's honestly. right yeah. that's right well Mara, we're coming to the end of the show thank you for making good news with angela savage <laughs> great news with angela savage here today i'd love to have you on again sometime of course your sons too and if maybe you could talk alonso into coming on the show that would be nice <laughs> I have to at least ask, right? He's very congenial. He, uh, he's, he's having he's a good a time, good it looks like. He has, yeah. yeah. And, and, and uh, quite honestly, I just uh, have so much respect for him because, uh, you know, he, uh, he just, just come up with this idea of coming, you know, to Indianapolis. He had that in his mind. In fact, about three years ago, I was in Monza, and uh, he was still, he was last year with Ferrari, and, and he said to me, he says, Mario, someday I would like to do Indianapolis. What do you think? And, and I said, yeah, you should, you know, you should, uh, you should do it. I think it's a great experience. And, uh, but I thought that would be after his career as a race driver. Mm. I mean, uh, no, as a Formula One driver. Right, right. Which would be probably at the twilight of his career. Mm -hmm. Instead now, he's at the top of his game, you know, has nothing to lose in Formula One because, you know, the cars are not very competitive there at the moment. So here he is. So he may have a very joyful uh, moment in this uh, for the season you know with uh, getting a result here for the race yeah you know he's been my favorite driver for years and I, I usually you know don't like to have favorites they're all my favorites but it sure has been exciting having him come over and getting to kind of be a part of that history it's a big yeah. deal when the Formula One drivers come over you know so well, I a good guy he's, yeah I'm really um, one of the good guys. honored to be here what what went and get to watch him race here yeah yeah. Well, Mario, uh, thank you so much. I just thank Pleasure. you from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your day to come on my show. Pleasure. I hope we have time to speak again sometime in the future. I don't know what else we can talk about. I know. Well, I well, we, well, can, well, we can talk about animals. Okay. <laughs> we can talk about that all day. Anyway, God bless you, and um, thanks again. That was uh, great news. Good news with Angela Savage. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon.